I want to thank Janet Prince and Paul Dufour, who isn't here, for inviting me today. Uh, as you'll see in my little paragraph bio, I'm one who promotes the cause of college and polytechnic educated graduates in applied science and applied technology. So I'm very honored and pleased to be among all of you who work for basic science, discovery and curiosity based research and advanced learning. You represent the ideas and talent without which we can't have better innovation outcomes in the country. Uh, as you will hear in my remarks, I'm a strong proponent of collaboration across the academic system and being here today is one way for me to advance that vision. Um, before I get going though, and because the previous panel made so many references to the report that I'm going to be explaining to you, um, but then I had the questions that suddenly struck me. How many of you know that Canada has a science and technology strategy? Can I just poll? Two. And how many of you think that Canada has an innovation policy? Okay. Well, all right, that, that will help me. Um, and I know your focus is on uh, Quebec science policy today, but I'm going to now take our conversation up to a, a national level and a bit of a macro picture. Uh, this is not about one sector of clean tech or um, high tech, but it's sort of a kind of peanut butter understanding of the problems in Canada with respect to innovation. I think it's very important to have a focused and constructive discussion with the science community as well as those focused on innovation. The two are not the same but intrinsically connected. <clears throat> in my day job, because this was my night job, <laughs> I work to promote the cause of a model of education that is occurring outside Quebec. The polytechnic model of applied learning and applied research being delivered in ever increasing strength by graduates at all levels of degree granting colleges, community colleges you might have called them, that are focused on helping industry to innovate. Our faculty and students have equal cause to be considered part of the knowledge economy. And as you might see by the end of my chat with you today, they should be embraced as part of the talent for innovation that Canada needs. But my remarks today are not about polytechnic education, nor the state of science and the effectiveness of Canada's science and technology strategy. Yes, we do have a science and technology strategy. My remarks will focus on business-facing federal R&D programs that support commercialization. So that's a very different thing than talking about science programs. I was asked to share the findings of an important report that was published almost a year ago, and that is what I will do. The report is called Innovation Canada, a call to action. Innovation Canada, le pouvoir d'agir. It's available on our website, summary and all 180 plus pages, and a whole bunch of resource documents if you go into that website. What was the purpose of the report? There's a long-standing conundrum in Canada that the highest educated workforce and strong investment in basic research is not leading to improved commercialization. The previous panel talked about that. And particularly business innovation, which are the foundations of competitiveness and productivity. So in 2010, the federal government created a panel to review, and this is the formal title of the panel, Federal Support for Business Research and Development, chaired by Tom Jenkins, the panel included three key representatives from the academic sector. David Naylor, president of the University of Toronto, Arvind Gupta, and myself. And we had one of the foremost world's tax policy experts, Bev Dalby, from the University of Alberta, and Monique Leroux, who's president of Desjardins Banks. This October 2011 report called for a bold action and a fundamental rethink of how government support for business innovation is structured and delivered given the withering performance of Canadian business in investing in research and development in terms of finding commercial value through the creation and sale of new products, 
goods and services. So the next slide, please, Janet. Um, just, if anyone's looking for translation, it's channel one. So today, this is what I will talk about. We'll quickly get through, I think the previous panels tried to get to some aspects of innovation. We'll get through that. We'll explain to you what the mandate of the report was, uh, what were the key recommendations, and put a focus on what's not working because, you know, it's not good enough to simply say how well things do work because the outcomes aren't there. I want to then dive into the things that people might have forgotten or not seen in a very long report and that I believe are the hidden gems of the report. And still the action that Velma mentioned might yet come and of course the aspiration that we all share. So that's how today's uh, chat will go through. Next slide please. Um, so the very important here for me as I looked at your program today to set the context and the context is innovation. It is not science and technology strategy. It is not science policy. And it's really critical unless we get this right now, the rest of the report becomes misunderstood. Innovation is often mistaken for invention. It is not. The OECD has a definition for innovation, and that is, and I quote, implementation of a new or significantly improved product, good or service, process, a new marketing method, or a new organizational method in business practices, workplace organization, or external relations. So it's not just anything new, it must also constitute a viable business concept. And the previous panel talked about it must have commercial success. So there's an element understood here about making something. And so then why does it matter? Because innovation creates wealth, which creates jobs. It drives a country's long-term economic growth. Nations need to remain need innovation to remain globally competitive. There is something called an innovation consensus in the developed world, if not in the wider set of countries. So that it's important here with all of you to establish that innovation is no longer limited to an engineering or technology context. Service sector innovation is growing too in applied health, in, in simply marketing. And the understanding of innovation has now broadened from a purely scientific and technical focus to include the application, use of information technologies, creation of new customer experience or service delivery approaches. This applies all the more to Canada, which without innovation will have a hard time competing with low income, low wage nations that are outpacing us in other forms of innovation frugal innovation, think of India's tablet, or copycat, derivative innovation, some would say China. So for today's purposes, a better word for innovation and what I'm gonna talk about is commercialization. It's more than making shiny new widgets, it's more than just science policy. Now, we've been talking about Quebec, we've been talking about Canada. Hopefully, there'll be moments in my chat today when we think a bit bigger and realize that countries can organize their procurement policy to purchase goods and services, as Velma mentioned, or tax policy to raise revenue, or they can use those same policies to spur innovation. That is what we found when we worked on this panel and began to look at the comparators between Canada and the other countries. Equally, countries can set up their science policies to simply support science, <coughs> or organize their investments in scientific research in ways that also support technology commercialization and the innovation needs of industry and society at large. So, Canada does not have an innovation policy. Policies in support of business R&D are the closest we get to innovation policy and as the previous panel pointed out, R&D is only one part of innovation. Ideation, experimental development, our early stages of the innovation process, market validation, cost avoidance, scaling up, prototyping, along with business and market development, 
customer demand, customer demand are all part of the innovation process. And not all of these pieces are recognized and encouraged by government programs. Finally, innovation is not linear. It's not idea to invoice. It's idea push, it's demand pull. It's a continuous process. So, um, I guess we're on to the next slide, please. So now back to the mandate of the panel. And I'll go very quickly through it, or you can read the slide for yourself. This is that perennial conundrum I mentioned earlier. While our investment in higher education and training in Canada puts Canada at the top of the OECD country rankings, the performance of our business sector in R&D is shockingly low. Traditionally, the analysis is to cast blame on Canadian industry for not investing in its own R&D, for not hiring enough scientists, for not investing in equipment, for sitting on its capital. But maybe some other explanations are emerging too. Again, last week, the World Economic Forum pegged Canada down on innovation and competitiveness. What was its stated reason for doing so? That there is a less favorable assessment of research institutions and government procurement. So this reality of low business R&D holds true despite having one of the most generous tax credits in the world. This is known as the Scientific Research and Experimental Development Tax Credit. Such credit, tax credits are widely used in many other countries to incent incremental private sector R&D and in emerging countries, emerging economies as well. In addition, Canada has over 500 programs, federal and provincial, in support of science, technology, and business R&D. While we spend considerable sums, we have the well-documented innovation lag that has persisted and grown worse over decades. Our challenges are specific to Canada, but they are not unique to Canada. The United States, Australia, the UK, Scandinavia, and Japan share most or all of the same problems as we do, at a time when new players such as Russia, Brazil, China, India, and Korea are upping their innovation activity in order to compete in an increasingly global intensive economy. So the mandate that was given to us was, what's working, what's not, what gaps do you see, what would you realign on a zero-sum basis in something like six billion dollars of federal government support for business R&D? There were 60 plus programs in that mandate. They had never been reviewed as a set, as a whole, and they had never been cross-compared. That five to six plus billion, the largest amount of it was that tax credit I mentioned. 3.7 to 4 billion a year is used for that tax credit for companies that can prove that they've done R&D. And then about a 1 billion plus is given to industry to do R&D <coughs> through what is called direct programs. You've seen some alphabet soup already. It's called IRAP and there's more than that. The programs were about R&D, not SNT, not science and technology. And that was a major constraint on the mandate of the panel, and that is not properly understood by the public at large. So the confounding question we were asked was whether there are public policy levers available to government to adequately enable improved business R&D performance to spur innovation in Canada. Given the over $5 billion per year, and the 35-year-old tax credit program, the question was not inconsequential. In a time of government fiscal restraint, the question becomes all the more urgent. So, it's very important with all of you here to say on the next slide, what was not in our review? <coughs> so this was not a review on IP or competition policy. There's actually a previous report on that, known as the Red Wilson Report. This was not a review of federally funded R&D. This was business R&D. This was not a review of basic discovery research programs. This was about applied research when done for industry. 
and on. And it was not a review of the indirect cost of research program that helps to support basic research activity at universities. <coughs> And these were serious constraints on the work of the panel and our mandate. Remember as well, the programs were federal. They were not federal and provincial. In other words, we were not looking at a national picture. We did not do a sectoral analysis. We did not do a geographical regional analysis. This was not a review of NSERC or SHRP discovery grants. I assume you all know that alphabet soup. CIHR was not under scrutiny. This was not a review of all of NSERC's funding, in other words. The only NSERC programs under review were those that are so-called focused on business through their research partnerships program, about $300 million of its annual one plus billion dollar spend. Nor was this a review of the National Research Council's intramural research. Federal in-house research is a whole other spend and faces its own constraints. Furthermore, the context matters. There were, our panel worked in the context of a whole bunch of other reviews going on. NSERC sought a review of its programs through the Canadian Council of the Academies, the report just came out uh, in July. The Science and Technology Innovation Council was issuing its State of the Nation report. And on and on it goes. Um, we were not operating in a vacuum and I really need you to know that. We also faced many complexities. When we set about our work in the fall of 2010, we sought as many indicators for each of the 60 programs that we could, seeking as much information as we could from the civil servants, the bureaucrats, on input, output, outcomes, and impact. Guess what? Soon it was evident that a cross-comparison of programs was not possible to do in the time that we had. I should tell you that I read 28,000 pages to get through the year, and that was my night job. Then, the cross-comparison problem. You can't compare tax credit dollars with dollars that are given to a university to commercialize its research. Those are two different kinds of dollars. Tax credit dollars are company's dollars that the company gets back through its um, tax returns. That's not the same as government giving direct dollars to fund an intent. <coughs> so it became really complex. We started then, in frustration, doing something called binning the programs. We binned the programs by their intent. What's the intention of the program? Is it for creating talent for innovation? Is it for commercialization? Is it for procurement? And so on. What we did not do is we did not recommend killing any program. Why? Because closing programs is a political decision and we were constrained in not being able to say which ones were not working, even though the government asked us to say that. And that is the inertia of the status quo that Velma mentioned. Imagine the hue and cry from the various vested interests if we dared to say that such and such a program was in effect. So, on to the next slide. So all that's the bad news. But we did come to ground on six bold-facing recommendations. There was another constraint on the panel's work, and this is very important for you to understand. We chose to be a consensus-based panel. In other words, we as six panelists, independent experts, agreed on every word of the report. So there could be no dissenting opinion, there was no minority report. So this is what we could agree to. And I'd let you infer what that means. Again, this, these are consensus-based recommendations. And they are very important. Um, the first was that there is no entity to deliver industry-facing R&D. And we'll get into that in a bit. The next was the tax credit is too complicated and companies are not using it or are using it to gain the system or are using it as a proxy for capital. The next one was one mentioned by Velma that procurement, co-procurement is one thing, but why don't we use procurement to stimulate innovation? <coughs> the Americans do it, the Germans do it, the Scandinavians do it, why don't we? 
The next was to transform the industry-facing institutes of the National Research Council, the ones that are there to help <coughs> you. The next one was the point made by the earlier panel that early stage capital, risk capital, venture capital is not working as well as it could, it's not scaled up as much as it needs to be in Canada. And finally, the one uh, where someone thought it meant chief science officer didn't, it meant uh, create a national entity for innovation with a national lead minister for innovation. Now, beyond these six bill-facing recommendations, there are several sub-recommendations, and I would actually invite you to read the report, look at the sub-recommendations, because that's where the action really lies. Now, as Velma and others have mentioned, the federal budget of 2012 began to act on some of these areas, particularly the ones that involve some sort of change <coughs> in funding or program design. But those that involve governance, system redesign, what is known as machinery change inside the Ottawa Beltway, these are still eluding us because that's where the real bottleneck lies. So now, let me tell you about what we really found, things that may not be said quite that way in our report. Specifically, we found the following R&D challenges. There are too many government programs sped, spread too thinly across too many government departments, making it hard for companies to locate the program that's right for them. You might actually feel that way as scientists too. How many p different programs in the suite of <coughs> science funding programs have so many acronyms? So understand how it feels for a small company to know which program out of these 60 really is meant for me. The tax credit is too complex, too unpredictable in what qualifies as research. And I think that was mentioned by the previous panel. It's too costly to actually apply for for some claimants. And it may not be stimulating the R&D it was intended to foster. We do not leverage procurement. Uh, there's a lack of access to financing. The programs are subscale. They operate within the silos of numerous federal departments. The alphabet soup is just stunning. The research granting councils, the tri council that you would know, have suffered mission drift, blurring the lines between basic academic research and industry focused applied research. Programs that purport to focus on commercialization actually assist academia and not those companies whose core purpose it is to commercialize ideas for the market. National outcomes for federal R&D have never been set. Innovation in one part of the country is not considered as in the same as innovation in another. So the Atlantic Opportunities Agency runs an innovation fund. It's not the same as what's defined as innovation by Western Economic Diversification. These are two federal agencies. <coughs> and finally, our R&D talent programs have narrowly focused only on graduate and postgraduate student supply, seemingly on the belief that best and brightest means highest trained thinkers and managers, and not necessarily the highly qualified skilled doers. The majority of R&D staff at Canada's 1.1 million small and mid-sized firms does not hold doctorates. We survey. In fact, almost two-thirds are MA or bachelor level graduates, and a vast majority of them are technicians and technologists. Yet innovation talent programs focus only on the elite cadre of knowledge workers. No one minister has full accountability in cabinet over business innovation. And finally, as you will hear me say many times, we do not have an innovation strategy, only a science and technology strategy. So that's the bad news. Um, next slide. I'm going to now get you through what I think, now that the gag order is lifted on me, are the hidden gems of the report. These there, I will focus on four. Um, let's go to the next slide. I'm very glad that we have a graphic in the report that tries to get the innovation ecosystem right. It's the next slide. This uh, graphic um, presents to me 
an inclusive and accurate positioning of the players in the innovation team sport that we need to play. It was developed and modified by Peter Nicholson, the first head of the Canadian Council of the Academy. What it shows is that the innovation space in this country is made up of a multitude and diversity of stakeholders and actors. Small, medium, and large firms, universities, colleges, polytechnics, private R&D firms, public labs, accounting firms, policy experts, and government program managers. In Quebec, you'd know of the CCTTs, right? Centre Commercial de Transfer de Technologie. An ecosystem map like this actually helps say where we are in that endless spectrum on innovation. I like it because it positions college applied research correctly. We, in the college world, are not aiming to do basic science. We are aiming to apply it to industry's needs. Um, I think what was very important about this and all the related text in the report around this is the fact that the Jenkins report began to introduce a new acronym. Highly qualified, skilled people, highly qualified and skilled workers. Previously, the acronym has been HQP, highly qualified people. Implicit in that has been a code word for doctoral graduates, <coughs> an exclusive term when the country needs inclusion. In my view, in terms of the talent, it's not an either or proposition. When we say highly qualified, skilled people, it is a plea for recognizing the complementarity of talent. It is a core vision of the system where all actors are playing to their strengths and to their unique roles. Universities to basic research, colleges and tech transfer offices on applied research, and companies of all sizes focused on commercializing their products, ideas, and services. The next hidden gem of the report is the guiding principles, it takes up one page of the report, and you can go there. There you will see what we said, that Canada needs these transformative programs. Canada needs to require that all public spending require demonstration of net benefit, and so on. Uh, I think the one that matters here is the focus on outcomes, and the focus on design for flexibility. Too many of the eligibility criteria of the programs are so narrow that they impede collaboration and they, they are in fact themselves not innovative. Um, I'll skip through that and go to my next one. For me, the next slide, what I uh, think is an important nugget in the report is the sentence on NSERC and its confused mandate and metrics. And the sentence reads as follows. There's a need to distinguish between the support by NSERC and CIHR of solution-driven research and their support of basic discovery research, ensuring that both receive adequate funding and are evaluated using appropriate and relevant metrics. There is a different motivation for the, this, the two ends of this spectrum. And there's a different measurement. And when we measure things wrongly, we then hold the wrong program to account for not delivering. And we can make mistakes as we assign these vitally important public dollars. If we got it right, if we actually stopped torturing NSERC, could we actually get to a better balance, improved collaboration across the current academic silos? And that is why the panel recommended create the industry-facing business council so that we could actually let NSERC go back to what it was created to do. If we did get it right, can you imagine the collaboration and balance? And, uh, and can you imagine <coughs> abandoning the zero-sum mentality that now dominates, that one cent to applied research means one cent less to basic research? We need to accept that research is part of a single continuum, with some research questions closer to impact than others, but both aspects needing equal balanced funding. And we don't have. Um, 
Next and last gem for me is the talent strategy. You can see where I'm going. Um, 20 programs in NSERC were subscale, input oriented, and focused on eligibility criteria instead of outcomes. But those 20 programs were more or less about helping the talent from the academic world go to work in the um, broader industrial world, the private sector, the public sector, etc. Most of those programs were focused on those industry connections for academics through scholarships, networks, collaboration. There was very little of the 20 NSERC programs that we reviewed that were on commercialization. So actually only one. What was striking to us when we looked at this is that there was an absence of all the other ways in which the federal government supports town. We were not allowed to look at the Human Resources Skills Development um, Department's Youth Employment Strategy, or Apprenticeship, or Entrepreneurship. They, because, you know what? They're not considered part of the knowledge economy. They're not considered part of innovation. The recent focus on science, technology, and engineering math education is simply not built into these programs, the existing programs on talent. And the challenge is how do you create that highly qualified, skilled workforce that we've been talking about? The panel and its report outlines that a broad range of workforce skills and occupations are involved in the implementation of innovation. This is because innovation encompasses a very broad range of economic <coughs> activity that I had earlier described. And it's not restricted to science and engineering alone but it will involve direct production workers, tradespersons, technicians, people in marketing, finance, and human resources. Sometimes innovation is incremental, and that incremental change relies largely on learning by doing and learning by using. I would suggest that's a hallmark of polytechnic education. So if the primary form of innovation involves diffusion and adaptation of existing technologies, we also need, therefore, that all Canadian workers be included in the talent support for innovation. And thus, I would say, break the silo, <coughs> encourage collaboration amongst people. Remember, companies commercialize and people innovate. And so I believe innovation is a team sport and we need to treat it as such. Like all good team sports, we need the best players in each position to compete with other teams. Let's show up for the highly charged global competition with our best players. Are we leaving? the highly talented people on the bench, like our tradespeople, our highly trained foreign professionals, our technicians and college graduates, and our existing workforce. So those are the things I would point to as still bearing tremendous amount of action from the federal government. Now let me point to where I think action and aspiration lie. Oops, there we go. You can see where I'm going to go with respect to the role for industry. Report on report has focused on the historical over-reliance on the then low Canadian dollar, the resource economy, the lack of sufficient access to capital, and the risk-averse business culture of Canada's private sector. The prevailing logic is to blame industry for the lack of receptor capacity for the ideas and inventions being generated by the fundamental discovery-based research. All these programs that we reviewed are built on an old model of idea push and assume that innovation is a linear activity. When the rankings come out year over year and show Canada's slumping commercialization performance, it gets really easy to blame industry. Sorry, that's just not fair. The tens of billions of dollars that taxpayers have invested in R&D over the last decade have gone to push innovations to market rather than facilitate industry identifying the problem, the challenge, the opportunity, and collaborating with us to solve the problem and find a solution. Demand-driven applied research is the missing link. We don't have to swing the pendulum completely the other way, but we must acknowledge that there is a role for the government to fund demand-driven research, to complement <coughs> the basic research. So the next action that has to come is program consolidation. This is the whole issue of the 60 programs and the alphabet soup. What did we say? We said that over time, consolidate business innovation focused on similar outcomes into a smaller number of larger, more flexible programs open to a broader range of applicants and approaches. So the same spend, but do better. And what would happen if you did that? 
small firms would become larger. Maybe you'd actually have a vision of a people-centered innovation. Maybe you'd add C to s and and you'd get actually innovation, commercialization to s and The other action that I believe in Velma was suggesting this that has to come is you've heard me say we have no innovation strategy, we have no innovation policy, we have no federal department for innovation. Look at our competitor countries. In the UK, what's it called? Department of Business, Innovation and Skills. <coughs> you can see that in Australia. You can, as we said in our report, Canada needs a business-led innovation council. Now let me go to my almost last point, aspiration. So this is the more, you know, can it change in five years, ten years? Can we keep trying? Don't give up. We really need true public and private partnership for R&D. I call it P3 R&D. That's not mentioned in the report. That's my word. The Germans do it. Why not us? You must know about the Fraunhofer model. It's very instructive, where, where the private sector comes and leverages its money, works with federally funded research institutes, collaborative teams, you know, high-minded scientists working with people from the universities of applied science, working with companies, and there are, what, 59 Fraunhofer Institutes that come together to solve a problem, commercialize it, and then can go on and actually disappear. To me, basic research song commercialization is just one of those examples where Canada <coughs> is a hewer of wood and drawer of water. We export our raw commodities, our ideas, without adding value to the commercialization of ideas. So we need to become more amenable to commercialization. Currently, we leave it to others to commercialize our inventions. Um, so there is, to me, behind this whole notion of improved public-private partnership for R&D, a connection between thinking, making, and innovation. And that is the cornerstone of a healthy economy. So, uh, to wrap it all up, the key takeaways from what I've said today is that the R&D report, the Jenkins report, lays the ground for a new approach. Could the government have done it in one federal budget? I don't think so. In some ways, the hardest work is still there uh, ahead of us. Much harder to change the culture of the federal bureaucracy. The input-minded owners of programs, the vested interests for whom the only answer to any new idea is we don't need that, we already do that. Do you know how many times the bureaucrats told us that? We already have that. No, the Americans have SBIR. Do you all know about SBIR? Small Business Innovation Research. Companies working with universities, getting um, money to actually start up a company, try out a problem. No, no, I is that. No, that's not going to be the way forward. So, I really believe that restructuring our supports for business innovation is the equivalent to changing the oil in a car while driving down the freeway. It's not impossible, but it's not going to be easy. And we need the right tools. Canadian business can't wait for government to hit the reset button and start from scratch, and our global competitors won't wait either. All sectors and all actors should help to support the further changes and provide their ideas and sweat equity to the urgent national effort on innovation. And so as you've been discussing all morning and will today, scientists and industry need to work together more effectively. Canada punches far below its weight when it comes to moving our knowledge to practical value. We don't need as much to ask new research questions as much as we need to answer questions in a more collaborative and multidisciplinary way. For our current elementary and secondary school students, for our post-secondary learners, for graduates, for industry, frankly for Canada, we need more collaboration. One of the things from a government point of view that's important is that our sophisticated competitors, and I've been mentioning them, Understand that innovation policy goes beyond science policy. Their innovation strategies constitute a coherent approach that seeks to coordinate disparate policies towards scientific research, commercialization, IT, education, tax, trade, IP, procurement, regulatory policy in an integrated fashion that drives economic growth by fostering innovation. 
So, in short, many of our implements in our innovation toolkit are not working, are underutilized, are developed from an outdated understanding of business innovation needs. These problems have accrued over several years, even decades. What dismayed me throughout the year of the panel work was the creeping realization that there is no quick fix, nor can there be. But without some fundamental rethink of policies and programs now, there will never be a fix. So we need to update our blueprints for better action on innovation. And remember, companies commercialize, people innovate. considerable debate about our <coughs> recommendation and the government needs to consult further. So what happens with these reports is they spawn the next consultation. So what in fact the federal budget did is spawn a consultation on the tax credit, spawned a consultation on venture capital. Well, in fact, we should go back to the panel again and see how their changes have... Yes, but the, these things are about the vested interests and making sure that everybody's had a say so, you know, there's a cottage industry in panel report writing in this country. And there's a, some new ones to come. CCA is going to issue a report on September 27th on the state of science and technology in Canada. And six months from now, CCA is coming up with another report on the state of industrial R&D in Canada. So it's CCA? Canadian Council of the Academies. So, you know, this stuff keeps going. But what the government did do is say, all right, this notion that there needs to be an industry-facing logic, let's see if we can try it. They're going to try doing that with the National Research Council. Maybe that'll work, maybe that won't work. We as a panel didn't think that's where it should be. Um, and then the government did put some money, but again, wants to consult industry, how should we improve venture capital? So there is way more to be done. And one of the easiest ones, but, will require willpower is the consolidation of programs. You have programs at 15 million a year. How's that gonna help? And they're sitting there stacked on provincial programs of seven million a year. Why can't we scale these programs up? Why can't we look for the right outcome? So I think a lot of work is going on right now in Ottawa about that. And there'll be a lot of lobbying and there'll be a lot of pushing. Um, but I, I would leave you with, uh, it took 40 years to get here. It's not gonna be fixed in one budget. Two budgets, one election, two elections. It's going to take a while. Thank you very much.